of the summer choir. Thank you so much that so many of you came back. Thank you. We turn now to the second easier reading. <laughs> and we continue the story of Pentecost with Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 21. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, there are, they are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Every, and even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the movement and power of your spirit, which is such a gift. And we pray that as we reflect on your word in that marvelous moment, that we will see it not simply as a story told over 2,000 years ago, but as the promise that you will continue to move in our midst and transform our lives and this world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. I have a confession to make. I like watching Downton Abbey on TV. <laughs> it's not an easy thing to be able to admit in public. I was a little afraid because when I first saw it with Jill, I was being a good husband. I thought it was going to be the cross between little women and Pride and Prejudice. And I thought somebody was going to take my man card away from me. But I ended up really liking it. And one of the reasons that I like it is because, well, let me tell you first. It starts out, for those of you that aren't addicted, starts out right before World War I in England. And it's this amazing aristocratic castle with all these interesting people. And it's not only the story of the aristocrats, the Crawley family, but it's also about the servants that live below and all of the interworking of all of the, uh, of the situation in their lives. But then something happens in World War I. And now all of a sudden, all bets are off. Change is taking place. And then after the war, it doesn't quite go back to the way it was. And I like it, I think, because you're watching how these characters, both the wealthy and the servants, deal with the amazing change that's taking place, upsetting the world in which they live. And I loved it because it teaches us how we deal with change. We see ourselves in the characters. We wonder if we're the one that's not be handling the change real well, whether we're the one looking forward to it. It's just so interesting. And in the passage of Scripture that we read today, or that Gary did the hard part for, again, it's about people's inability to handle change. All of a sudden, you had the, the crucifixion. There was change. The apostles were frightened. They were scared to death. Everything they thought about their religion had been taken away from them. And then there was this odd resurrection, empty tomb moment. And then a resurrection. But what did that have to do with them? Did Jesus leave them? You'd think when Jesus goes up to heaven that they would go, man, this the religion's for real. But they didn't. They couldn't handle all the change. They were scared to death that they were going to be left there to their own devices. And so they sat huddled around on a Jewish holiday, which was the the festival of harvest, which is what Pentecost is, or started out being. And then all of a sudden, huddled together for protection in the midst of their fear and their doubt, the Spirit of God 
transformed them, and they began speaking in all the languages of the different people from all over the world who had gathered for the Pentecost, the Harvest Festival. And they started speaking each in their own other people's languages. How could these do it? These simple men from the Galilee were speaking all these different languages. And people didn't like it. So what happens when people are uncomfortable or they make change? They make fun of it because they don't know how else to handle it. And Peter, who had just denied Jesus three times, gets up. And it wasn't just that he spoke a different language. But God, through the Holy Spirit, gave them the wisdom of utterance that what he said when the Spirit filled him became truth. And with the entire scripture before him, he quotes Joel, the the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. And he explains why the Holy Spirit that's happening to them right now is the fulfillment of what happened in the past, changes the present, and will change for the better the future. Now, the thing that I find most interesting about Downton Abbey is that I can understand how the aristocratic rich people would not want change. They have their castle, they have their money, they have their servants that they don't have to pay very well, and they get to live on top of the world. If you watch the show, the one thing I really love about it is the servants, the cooks, the footmen, the butlers, the maids, are as scared of change even when they're probably going to benefit from it. We are all scared to death of what's going to happen because we can't control the change. We see it all the time, and it happens especially in churches. And right now, most Christians are scared to death of the change that's going on in our church. In the last week, And I've seen it on, I have the little Yahoo that comes up, you know, and you check your email and you see your little news articles. Jill texts me, boy, you got to check this out. I saw it on AOL. AOL. Good Lord. (laughs) You're old. (laughs) And it had this whole thing and it had the Pew Research Center, which is one, it's Gallup refers to them. They do a lot of religious polling. And what they found was frightening. But we all know it's true, we just didn't want to see it, of the changes taking place in the church. They did a study between 2007 and 2014. We're not talking about the difference between the 1960s and the, and the new millennium. We're talking about 2007 to 2014, seven years. And in that seven-year period, there was a little good news. They found out that the black Protestant community of churches has stayed relatively stable. They found out that the evangelical churches are slightly decreasing, but not horrifically so. But they found out that mainline churches, you're all guilty for being here today, are part of the mainline church. We've lost in seven years over five million people. That's half of every man, woman, and child in the Methodist church gone in seven years. That is the Presbyterian church gone three times over in the last seven years alone. The only ones that are as dangerously in decline as we are are the Roman Catholics who have dropped three million in seven years. Frightening. You know what they're being replaced by? Nothing. Hindu, Buddhists, and other non-Christian groups in the United States have increased by about 1.2%, but there are so few of them nationwide that it really doesn't affect the scale. At the same time we were dropping by such a large degree, by over 8 percentage points, It was being replaced, the largest group that's growing and grew by 6.3 percentage points were atheists, agnostics, and those who claim nothing. You wonder where our people are going? They're not switching denominations. 
They're leaving to nothing. Or they're attacking the church by believing that God no longer exists. And that is frightening when I'm trying to get a pension. (laughs) But it is frightening. It's scary to think that if this, and if you add to the percentage by those people that are leaving, if that continues with those who are already left, within two more decades, the mainline church will be pretty much gone. Now, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and he's trying to develop his practice and make it larger. And he was saying that he had invited somebody else to talk about whether he wanted to work with him or not. And this other person, they had a nice visit. They, the interview went well. And then all of a sudden, the guy turns to him and said, so are you a Christian? And my friend, who is raised uh, Jewish but is nothing, said, no. And then that person who comes from a very conservative Christian background goes, well, maybe I can do something about that. And I went, oh. Because that drove my friend so much further away from any chance or opportunity for something, some Christian relationship, that there was going to be no hope for this guy at all. And I thought, what happens in another 10 to 20 years when there is almost no mainline presence This is what the Christian faith is going to be? Arrogant phrases to try to bring people to a faith that's so limited, so small, so conservative, that it, in my humble opinion, pretty unloving. Is that what Christianity is going to be? We are here because we have a message that we need to share about love, openness, and acceptance. And that will be lost if we continue to decline. And yet, in the minute that I start getting worried about my pension, all of a sudden I remember it's not about you and me. It's about the movement of the Spirit. Sometimes I think we're like that little, that little mass of humanity that was the apostles sitting there worried because Jesus had ascended. What was going to happen? Oh, poor me. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came and everything transformed. The apostles didn't have to be scared at all. God's plan was to renew them and make them as large, as they're, as amazing as anything the world had ever known, the Christian faith. And in the moment where it seems most dark and bleak, I believe the Holy Spirit will use us as well transformed the church into the loving, caring, compassionate place it needs to be and use you and me in that process. Now, how is it going to happen? First of all, we, as the main line that have something to share, need to start sharing it. It's our own fault for our decline. It isn't that the Holy Spirit isn't here. It isn't the fact that we're misguided, I don't believe. It's the fact that we're scared to share our message. My friend who got accosted by the conservative, well, let me tell you, at least that person was saying something. It might have been a bad message, but they were saying something. That's why they haven't declined. We have so much to share, an openness and an acceptance. We have the true love and justice of Jesus Christ, a message that is not being proclaimed elsewhere. And we need to offer that, a place where you can go. Can you imagine, just for a minute, if tomorrow all the Christian churches in the main line were taken away, all the people that would not be fed, all the people that would not be cared for, all of the elderly who would be alone, the soup kitchens that would not be served, the food banks that would be empty. The message of the gospel that would no longer be allowed or heard anywhere. All of the Christian belief in ethics would go away. I don't believe the world, even if you hate the church, would want the church to be gone because of the impact that we make. 
I always roll my eyes at the media because over and over again, you get 13 crazy KKKers on the steps of the Capitol and they get three weeks of publicity. 13 people. But in a congregation and churches, the thousands in this community that get together in Iowa alone every week and worship in huge numbers who then go out and serve and care and respond to the needs of others and they never get any press. And then I say, wait a minute, it's not the media's fault. We don't talk about the work that we do. I bet there are people you work with and perhaps even in your own family that don't even know why you bother coming here. We always seem to have our hand out and you've got to give your pledge. We expect you to come on Sunday morning and, and here you're doing something else during the week. You're busy. It, it, you know, church does affect the soccer schedule every week. And you're running off to try to get back to church or to this and to that. Wouldn't it just be easier to get church out of your system? It would make your lives so much easier. And instead of saying something when they give you that little moment where they ask a question, you're embarrassed because you don't want to talk about your faith because you were raised in the mainline church. And so you've missed that opportunity to share gently without arrogance but humbly why you do this. How has your faith touched you? Why do you do this? How has the Holy Spirit moved in your midst how does it feel when you do something for other people that you didn't have to? How has God carried you through the difficult moments? We need to start listening for those cues, but not with some stupid slogan or some arrogant notch you can put in your Bible when you save somebody's eternal soul. That's God's job. Our job is to just begin to feel the Spirit in our midst and share from our heart I talk, and I'm a minister, and I talk more about the Minnesota Vikings with my friends than I do about Jesus Christ, and there's a problem with that. Because the, Jesus Christ doesn't lose all the time. <laughs> Our task is to either die and the world suffering the consequences, or we share and we grow. We have so much to be proud of. We do so many things here. We just have to open our mouths and talk about it. Not an invite somebody to save their soul from damnation, but invite them to something that is meaningful to you. And I bet it will be meaningful for them. That's the movement of the Spirit. I'm reading a book right now by a, by a Dr. Rodney Stark, who's a professor of religion and theology at Baylor University. And he wrote this long book that I'm not quite through yet called The Triumph of Christianity. And it was the history of the earliest church through the time of Constantine and why Christianity triumphed over all the other pagan religions. And what he said was, it was in their evangelism. But I love what he said evangelism was. It wasn't having the right dogma. Dogma is important. Doctrine is important. But not to bring somebody to the faith. What allowed the Christian church 2,000 years ago to grow was they invited their friends. They invited their family. And they didn't even talk initially about worship as much as they did to the works of caring and compassion for the poor. And when people were humbled by how they were caring for others, then they wanted to find out more. Then they went to church and for, in the church services. And only later did they find out about a specific doctrine. We need to invite and involve and be looking for people that we can share the ministry that we are doing, the caring and the responding and the justice issues that they can agree with and support. And then maybe, just maybe, the Holy Spirit, not you or me, the Holy Spirit will grab them 
and bring them on a Sunday and somewhere else. But if we don't, the Christian faith will become something that I don't think many of us want. And we have a chance through the movement of the Spirit to make a real difference in people's lives. A chance that is Spirit-filled, loving, compassionate, and just. And it is our task on this day to get started so that there is a Westminster and there are other churches when Beck is old enough to be confirmed, when he stands in this church one day, maybe baptizing his own child. And we have a responsibility to make that happen for our world. In Jesus' name, amen.